recording on. Uh, good evening, once again, dear listeners, Dr. Jonathan Henry, welcome. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation. It's my pleasure and joy and honor to host you during our educational sessions. It must have been godsend that we met on the airplane out of all the places <laughs> and maintain this friendship and please take it as the gesture of my greatest appreciation um, of, of our relation, hope to further our friendship. I'm not going to take too much time uh, in introducing you besides saying that you are a specialist in antiquities, graduate of Princeton Seminary, you know, a, a lecturer yourself. And above all, what pertains to our today's conversation was a part of archaeological expedition in Megiddo in Israel. And that's what we're going to talk today about. So we're all looking forward toward your presentation. So I'm passing my, so to say, virtual microphone and camera to you. And all attention. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Father Gutlinski. I appreciate the invitation. And it's uh, just nice to um, be speaking to a group of people, even though I can't see everybody. Uh, and it's been quite a while since I've given a public talk. I, I always enjoyed uh, going to libraries, church groups, wherever um, I can in, in my local area, just to get in touch with folks who are interested in the kinds of things I'm, I'm studying. And I feel like it kind of helps me to uh, continue to speak in plain language, um, like a regular person, hopefully, um, which is hard to do when uh, you are working on a PhD, for instance. And so um, I, I feel like just meeting regular folks um, like out and about is just really great um, to remember um, the kinds of questions that are um, feasible or possible to ask about the materials even, because uh, it's easy to get sidelined by your own agenda in the materials. And you forget the kind of questions that people are actually interested in and the kinds of questions that got myself interested in these things years ago. So I've been studying um, a lot of antiquities and, and um, these materials, especially the text of the Bible. But as I got older, um, church history and um, materials of all sorts for uh, quite a very long time since childhood. Um, and so I ended up uh, at Princeton University where I finished a PhD one year ago, um, just as coronavirus was um, decimating all opportunities to get around other people and to talk about um, all kinds of interesting things. So that's one of the reasons why I'm really glad to have this opportunity just to speak and to be, and um, even though you can't ask questions or raise your hand right now, I hope that you'll be thinking as I talk about the kinds of things that you're interested in, even if it doesn't pertain to something I raise um, as a main point, if I say something incidentally, or it just reminds you of something um, that you're interested in, I'm really happy to take those questions. I just wanna emphasize that at the outset. So I'm gonna pull my screen up. It worked when we were practicing. Hopefully it will work again. Here we go. Hey, there it is, right? Can people see that? Okay, all right. So that's, um, so I, I introduced myself just a little bit and um, I wanted to point out that archeology span of sites in Israel is sort of a, as sort of a um, site interest, if you will, um, is something I, I am interested in and I'm, I'm trained to do. Um, but what I usually study um, is, manuscripts for one thing. I, I like to look at uh, ancient texts from late antiquity. Um, one of those texts that I've spent an awful lot of time with, with is Acts of Thomas, um, which I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, it's, it's been taken apart and put together so many different times by so many different people. Um, and I, I have an interest uh, in seeing um, how that text tra was transmitted. And then exorcisms, and here is an exorcism uh, just a couple of sheets from an exorcism in uh, Mount Verlan in Greece. Um, and so I was actually flying, um, I think, from here to, I forget where, but I, that's where I met Father Gutlinski uh, was uh, in, I believe, Dusseldorf when I was flying back from here. And I had just gotten this bracelet from 
from the mountaintop there. And, and uh, I've been wearing it ever since, but he identified me as someone who uh, might be interesting to talk to from that. And um, it's, it's kind of interesting how I ended up here from that. So I thought I would, I would put that up on the screen um, as sort of a um, bit of memorabilia. So you saw exorcisms. And, and by the way, that doesn't mean I'm a weird person that I study exorcisms. I'm not a spooky guy or interested in spooky things. It just how it, how things sort of happen, you know? Uh, how do you get interested in those, the things you do? It's just that uh, one thing leads to another. I also study um, things in Rome that are, that are related to archeology, span but uh, more about what's on the archeology, span the epitaphs. I do a lot with inscriptions and things like that. So I will refer to inscriptions um, in, the, in the early church uh, building that I'm going to be, we're gonna be looking at some tonight, which is a really exciting thing to look at. So I'm excited. To, to talk about those inscriptions and what we can learn from them uh, down in, in the modern land of Israel. But here's an example of one that I put in my dissertation. Here's a guy named Paulus, who's an exorcist. And uh, he worked in Rome and was buried in uh, St. Calixtus catacombs. And you can go see that today on tour. Um, I don't know what kind of trips are being planned or not, not nothing's being planned right now, but uh, go on these trips if you can. Uh, you can see so many cool things. Um, so I'm here to talk about one of my trip. And I had not gone on too many um, trips like this. So this was a really cool uh, experience for me to head over to um, what's now known as Legio. Um, before it didn't really have a name. It was just a, a place in Megiddo, Megiddo in Israel. So you can see where I've marked it on the map. And this was back in 2015. And this was the first expedition to really start to uncover something that um, a couple of archeologists had suspected was under the ground, but we're not exactly sure. So there was, um, there was good evidence to lead um, Yotam Tepper and Matthew Adams and the others on this team to suspect and believe that there would be um, uh, a lot of good finds under the ground, but it was anybody's guess as to what that would be. So it was kind of cool to be a part of that first um, uh, survey into the ground. There was, had been prior um, minor uh, digs just to see that there was something worth digging for and putting together a large crew, but this was our first chance to really get in there. So um, yeah, that's me usually in the books, here I am going over there. Um, one of the reasons I went was um, because of uh, a friend of mine, Mark Letney, who's an archeologist who works on this project and has for quite a while. And then here are the principal players um, on this project, Matthew Adams, who's the director of um, the Jezreel Valley Regional Project and the Albright Institute for Archeological Research, um, Jonathan David and Yotam Tepper. And Yotam Tepper is the one who's been at this project for years and years and years, and really um, uh, making a name for this place, if you will. Um, so when we talk about the, the first Christian church and things like that, um, Yotam Tepper is, uh, he was a graduate student at the time. Um, and uh, now, um, very, very lauded, very well known, and very uh, respected archaeologist. Um, and a lot of that is thanks to the finds that we're going to be talking about tonight. So they really drove home on that first night. I thought it would be kind of nice just to show the anticipation um, on the night before a dig such as this, um, as Matthew Adams was uh, gathering around the crew to emphasize just how, for the very first time in a, in a very long time, um, we would be seeing perhaps uh, walls, um, foundations, um, um, who knows what, but we would be seeing things that hadn't been uh, exposed to the human eye for uh, a very long time. So you get up very early on an archeological expedition. If you've ever been on one, maybe uh, uh, comment in, in the comments and um, we can find out how many people have been on a dig. Um, if you haven't been, I would recommend it if you think that you're able to um, do the physicality of it. That's, it can be very physical, a lot of exertion and, and early mornings and long days. But uh, boy, will you have a, a really interesting and, um, and uh, I think a very bonding time with other people. So anyway, here's Mount Tabor at sunrise. And I had to include this because this is just a gorgeous picture. 
Um, and it gives you a sense of, of the lay of the land in the Jezreel Valley. And I'll be talking about um, the Jezreel Valley momentarily, but I think this picture really gives you a sense of the importance of the mountain of Megiddo, right? Um, if you are fortifying your position against an army um, that might advance from yonder hill, you will have a good advance. You will have a good advance warning um, visually, if nothing else, of what lies before you. You'll have the strong position in the case of combat. They'll have to assault you from below um, and take the high ground from you. So you can see the strategic import of uh, Mount Tabor. And this valley is a rich trade route. So think of an interstate highway. Think of a major trade route that's near where you live. Um, what would happen if the trade routes were shut down? Well, I mean, it would be it would be um, a crisis in in many or most cases if you couldn't get supplies in and out. And this valley was instrumental and key to the trade and the economics of this area. And it has been this way for a very long time. Um, so I'm mainly interested in Roman times, but <laughs> by the time the the Romans came along there were already ancient ruins underneath their feet. And they didn't even know who those people were. Um, in fact, that's one of the fun things to me is to see what the Romans built over in, uh, at this site. And, and to see that they really didn't care what kinds of materials were under their, under the foundations. Uh, you know, they weren't going to do archeology. span Who cares? It's, it was a long time before them. They were building another empire, you know, that had come after another empire. And this, this was just, um, very storied land. So if you you know know your Bible whatsoever, um, Megiddo stands out as um, this is the top of that hill where we were just standing. So now we turn and, and look at what's on top of the mountain or on top of the hill. And um, you can see it's a pretty big hill, right? It's um, there's there's plenty of room to build fortresses, to build granaries, to put your grain in, to store um, things in warehouses. And this is what had been going on for a very long time. So as you read through, uh, for instance, you know, first Samuel, uh, first Samuel, second Samuel, first Kings, second Kings, um, or kingdoms, or however you designate um, such books, these Old Testament historical books um, will give you an idea of the importance, the strategic importance of this place and places like this. Um, kings fought over them and built important. Um, structures there and they documented it. And so it shows up in the Bible. It was that important um, that, you know, that this place was so key. Um, and so you have um, sort of reconstructions. I, I had as it was, boy, I wish I could change that now because this is not how it was. It was very colorful. It was full of light. Um, it, was, it was a hustling and bustling place with people going about their business. But this is a reconstruction of the site plan, if nothing else, of um, Old Testament Megiddo. And um, it's, this is not my area of specialization. And I'm willing, I'm happy to talk about this if there's any questions about it. But this is more um, sort of background to the, uh, site, the site plan that we're going to talk a little bit about here in just a moment. But there were, um, there was, this is actually a pretty um, important spot for Canaanite religion and Israel's religion. Um, and there's a temple there, there's a Holy of Holies, um, sort of a uh, sanctuary model there. Um, so it's, it's just a very interesting spot to go visit and to see uh, or to read about online. So we, but this is the Old Testament, um, you know, historic Israel's history up to the, um, up to the time of exile. And again, I just emphasize the, the many uh, places that you'll, or the many folks that you'll find mentioned in conjunction with the Jezreel Valley and the site of Megiddo. So anyway, coming down from that hill, that strategic um, hilltop um, fortification, and, and there's multiple fortifications, just layers upon layers upon layers upon layers. It's such a fascinating thing. Um, but we come down to, <laughs> Obviously, you see there's not any ruins here, right? This is just uh, a cow pasture. And this is how the site had been 
And it's kind of uh, fun for me to imagine um, the many years of buses pulling up to Megiddo to see the Old Testament sites, um, driving by these cows or perhaps farmers um, over the many years and not realizing that underneath this very unassuming looking spot is a site that's um, really as impressive um, and, and interesting as what they'll see on the official tour up on the hill. Um, so this, is, this has been a cow pasture for a very long time. And it's ha it has so much rubble in it that it's um, famous for not being of, um, <laughs> well, I have no historical value, but the farmers didn't really think it had much agricultural value uh, from what I can gather. Um, just because there's so much, uh, there's so much stuff right under the ground that you, it's hard to grow. It's hard to grow anything. And this is one of the ways that Yotam uh, was able to ascertain that this was probably a good site. You know, why won't, this is one of the things, you know, you look for, why, why won't anything grow here? Well, maybe there's a, there's a city under it, <laughs> you know, um, all kinds of stones. Uh, so that this is before he did a radar, uh, a radar plan, which I'll show you a little bit of that in a moment. Um, but just to kind of put in perspective, the, the pre-archeology span that you get into, um, there's stuff from World War I lying about in this field too. You know, um, the history just knows no um, real filter between the layers. Um, it, things get mixed up and um, it, it wasn't helped by the plows when they would try to plow it, just things getting mixed up in the ground. But um, here's one of the reasons why there's optimism. As you can see, um, this is a this is an advanced um, technological technique that's being used to identify archaeological sites now around the world. And you'll see a lot of diagrams like these um, posted in news stories, news items about archaeological finds. Uh, it's essentially like a, a radar for under the ground. And as you can see, this field that we're, you know, I'll go back to the slide, it's flat with the naked eye. You don't see much. You, you concentrate on cows and what's that building, you know, up on, the top of the screen, for instance. Um, and by the way, I want to point out that behind that white building, do you see the town on the horizon? Do you see like a town perhaps uh, just on the very top of the screen at the horizon? I'll be talking about that area momentarily uh, after, after we get into this dig as well. So there's, there's a bit of town and there's really actually a prison up there. And that's, that's gonna be very important. So just to give you a sense of how the layout of the land is, um, the prison I'm about to, I will talk about is uh, up over the rise there. So you can see that with this new technology, um, man-made shapes begin to emerge uh, from the ground. And so this kind of gives an idea of what areas to concentrate on. Now, for those who haven't been on a dig or those who are interested in seeing, um, I thought I would just throw in some, uh, some pictures from uh, from the site. I don't, you know, uh, just to see if this is something that perhaps <laughs> would be of interest. Now, this is really hot, by the way. So if you ever do go on a dig, um, keep in mind that the reason you go early is not because they're so industrious. It's not because they're so, uh, they've been reading Benjamin Franklin and believe that you should be early to bed and early, you know, early to rise. It's because it gets so hot and you have to leave at 2 p.m., 2, 3 p.m. Uh, to, go, to go back and sit under the shade. And that's a great time to sort through what you find out on the field. So this is incredibly hot before you get the tents set up over your site. Um, and the, uh, the objective is to clear that ground in the most uninvasive way possible. Um, so it's, it's not exactly like gardening. It's like gardening where you don't want to hurt anything. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's an exercise in patience. Um, as you can see, I said worst farmland ever. Uh, yeah, you can see why it wasn't a really popular place. You can see why there's not a gigantic um, carrot farm here, you know. Uh, and, and there is great produce to be had all around the Jezreel Valley. In fact, people would see us working there and bring us just some of the most 
delicious fruits and vegetables I've ever had. Um, growing right right across the road um, or down down the way. Um, so, oh yeah, so I, I did include a shell from, I'm not sure when this shell is from, somebody on the dig knew. Um, if there's any modern uh, warfare historians here who <laughs> shout that out. <laughs> So here's, um, here's how it goes. Uh, buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets of dirt. And um, I, think we, I think we captured that guy yawning right in the middle of carrying, what is that? One, two, three, four, probably eight buckets. Now, how are you yawning uh, while you're muscling eight full buckets of dirt. Well, you're really tired because you're doing this for hours and hours and hours and it's, you know, a hundred degrees. Um, so this is, this, is a, this is part of the fun. You see the sifter down there in the lower corner, a lower left-hand corner, and then there's the other sifter on the right. A lot of sifting. Um, so if you think Indiana Jones, if you think adventure, if you think, um, you know, cowboy, hat and a whip um, or whatever. No, sifting, 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 carrying buckets. That's, that's the Indiana Jones of the real world. Um, <laughs> so here's what you do. Here's what you get. So um, this, is with, this is with scraping. This has all been sifted. Every bit of that square has been sifted. Now, I'm guessing if this were an interactive classroom, if we were all sitting in a room, I would ask you, why do we do it in squares? Um, but I'm sure that this, this is something that you can imagine as you find items, and we did, um, you'll want to know where you found them in relation to other things, right? You want to know, did we find this in the building that turned out to be um, the, the um, the guards garrison or in the commander's um, toilet. You know, that'll make a difference. And both of those kinds of things have been found there. Um, so each square is numbered and there was some very advanced techniques, um, technology on this dig that enabled them to do 3D modeling as they went. They would go in with cameras and 3D model that entire square, every bump every ridge, every um, item in that square is encoded digitally. And every time a new layer is removed, that process is repeated. And that's repeated not just for this square, but for squares all across the site. And so this is repeated season after season until you have this accumulation of squares on a map with numbers and letters to help guide you um, just like you would on any map. So this is a map in the making with each little item uh, mapped onto it as if it were a town. Each coin is given a place on this map, uh, both um, yeah, longitudinally and latitudinally. Um, so that's, I think that's important to point out. So um, just some more dirt. In case you want to, so yeah, if you go on a dig, lots of dirt. Um, so we started to find a few things. Um, so on the left, you see little bits of glass. And I'm sure you've seen Roman glass in museum if you've been to museum or uh, shows that you know depict Roman life. Will often show the wealthy Romans with their glasses in hand, and Romans did have glass if they were wealthy. And um, we ended up finding lots of bits of glass here. I wanted to find a full glass, was not able to <laughs> you know, get that lucky. But if you go to museums, you'll see Roman glasses. Um, and then on the right, uh, we have olive seeds. Um, and these are not new olive seeds. These were not spit out by a farmer as he was plowing on a tractor. This is Roman olive seeds. Um, so, you know, uh, I, somebody joked, I, I can't remember who, but uh, that this might, might have been a Roman martini bar because uh, you have your glass and you have your, uh, your olives, you know, I don't know. So, um, 
so it's interesting though, the organic material, I wanted to point out the seeds because a, a big advance in archeology span these days is not the, the digging and the trowel and the, and the, you know, the dirty stuff. That's the stuff I went over there to do because I'm not a specialist in the sciences. I'm not a specialist in, in um, the kind of stuff I'm about to describe. Um, and that is, so there's uh, paleobiology, there's um, different kinds of archeological techniques for recovering um, different kinds of organic matter from ancient materials. And they can tell a lot of things from these ancient materials, not just dating, but they might be able to say, where is this from? Where is this, um, where's this kind of uh, wood from, for instance? Or where is this, or, or what kind of a bone is this? If we find a bone, we found the occasional uh, bit that felt like a bone. So they can test that and see, is this plaster or is this a bone? So that's not very advanced, but what kind of wood is this? How did this wood um, get here? How did this wood get preserved? We did find wood. Was this wood burned? Is this charred or was this, um, or is this just falling apart because it's so old? So they can tell all these things, they can test. And so we had scientists along who were doing provisional tests and um, those results will be coming out in time. Now, I wanna, I wanna stop for just a moment and explain um, a bit about how archeology span ends up in the public eye or in publications. So none of this stuff has been published yet. Um, as far as I know, uh, this has not gone to press. And, and the stuff that I'm about to show you, there's been stuff that's been published. Uh, when I say none of this stuff, these small bits and pieces. The, the dig itself, you'll find writing about that online. It's very well known. Uh, Megiddo, Jezreel Valley, yes. But all the little doodads, the items that we dig up, the, um, uh, the layout of the, of the site plan, um, a lot of that stuff waits to be published until it could be gone over very thoroughly. So what happens is that when an archeological dig occurs, the public will often get, if it's a big discovery, will get signs, will get notification, hey, a big discovery was made. But it takes five, 10, sometimes decades uh, of years for some of these, um, more detailed items to end up in um, book form for the broader public to get their hands on. And in some cases, even specialists don't see these articles or hear them in conferences um, for a year or two. So it's, it's, there's a big lag. There's a big time difference between when something uh, comes out of the ground and then when scholars are able to sift through that and draw conclusions and then finally when that can become something that will end up, let's say in a commentary, for instance. Um, and so it's, it's very difficult to um, say in this case, what some of the significance of things like olive seeds are going to be until a lot of these specialists have had a chance to argue and debate and go back and forth about them. And that takes years. So I wanted to just sort of emphasize how archeology span um, uh, can work in, time, in times when we have very spotty evidence like this. So um, there's a lot of inconclusive evidence that takes a long time to work through. And plus, they're still digging things up out of the ground. So, hey, this is, um, this is me bragging. It's sheer luck, but I got the first coin. Um, and uh, so we, we did find all kinds of things uh, like coins, um, but I wanted to go to this next slide. Do you see here what looks like roof tiles in that mix of rubble? Maybe some like Mediterranean roof tiles? Guess what? That's exactly what some of those are. We have roof tiles in there. We have um, gutters. We have a bit of plumbing in there. So it's a whole mixture of um, masonry that came up from various points of collapsed buildings, for instance. So if a building collapses, um, the roof tiles are not going to be very far from the drainage system, right? Um, so we find all of this rubble together uh, crumpled up and it has to be sorted out. So that's when you do a lot of this, um, this sorting. So, um, oh, 
So here's a few other things. Uh, here's a ring. So when we say that this was a, a camp for soldiers, um, in a minute we'll be talking about that. Don't think of um, people roughing it necessarily. Some people had to rough it. Some people had it very nice. So this there's a this is a this is a, a just like anywhere else in the Roman Empire is highly stratified. Some people at the top had just the most wonderful things you can imagine that were available to them uh, with the money that they had, and then you had your rank and file people who were either slaves or um, servile positions. Um, so here we have um, a, uh, I believe, a standard bearer. Uh, we have a small vessel, and we have some stamps, which I think is interesting. And, and these are backwards because they're stamps. They go into, um, you know, when you make an impression, you want it to be backwards. Now, here, here was something that uh, the stamp that we were really after. It's kind of hard to see, but um, you can make out it's hard to know what you can see on your screen. Um, but these tiles say leg and um, the Roman numeral six. And this was what we were hoping to find there. This is what the lead uh, archeologists were dreaming of finding was evidence that the Roman six legion, the iron legion had parked here. Um, and for how long is a question. Nobody knows how long the Roman Sixth Legion remained at this spot. And that's one of the questions guiding this dig is how long were the Romans even um, settled here or how long was the Sixth Legion here? So um, the Sixth Legion uh, is a very important legion. It's known um, to have existed, I believe, um, it was, I believe it was uh, its loyalty to um, Augustus or Julius Caesar. It was, it was way back um, several hundred years before the time that we're talking, uh, in other words. So we're talking a matter of centuries now that this, that this um, particular group of troops had been in existence as a body. Now that's kind of interesting in and of itself, right? To think about being part of a legion that's been around for several hundred years. Um, that kind of would probably give a sense of identity to soldiers, wouldn't it? If, uh, you know, I, I live in the United States, our military has been around about 200 years, um, and that's as far back as we can look. Um, what, if, what if one of our newer armies had been around for 300 years? You know, I, it's like interesting to think about how, how proud and how, um, how much lore went along with these um, with these um, legions. In fact, they had their own religion uh, that circulated throughout the army, Mithraism. Uh, if you look at Mithraism, it often goes along with the Roman military. Um, so it's just something interesting to look into is the military identity uh, in the Roman world. So anyway, the Roman tiles. So this gives us a sense of who's there. Um, of course, the, the Roman legions that were camped there were involved in one of the most famous events, one of the most uh, consequential events in history, which is um, the fall of the siege and fall of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD CE, depending on how you uh, designate. And so the Roman um, Sixth Legion actually went down to assist the Roman Tenth Legion as they fought in um, in in Jerusalem. Now here's a little history of Legio and Megiddo then. It kind of takes some of this into account, um, and I don't want to I don't want to spend uh, all the time in the world on this, but you can see some of the the troop movements um, that can be now mapped because of having hard evidence from the ground that the Sixth Legion was um, to be found up in, in in Jezreel Valley, and this kind of helps to place um, kind of helps to place the timing of a lot of this stuff too. So um, the, the Jewish six, or the Roman Sixth Legion really took hold um, in that area around 120 CE. If you can see on, the, on this timeline here, you have a early middle Roman period in blue. 
and that's from six to 300. Um, you have 67 to 70, that's the first revolt. In 70, you have um, the, the destruction of the temple, Jerusalem. You have Jew Jewish movement to Galilee, um, and you have a lot of building going on up there. And this is something that um, I think is still debated is how much movement to Galilee was there. That's for another time. And this is where we have the founding of the Jewish and Samaritan village of Kephar Otnei, which is right there at Legio. Um, and so if you go down to, uh, here we go, 120 CE, the sixth legion for is sent to Judea. And this is the most likely time that those roof tiles would have been uh, pressed and placed in, and those buildings um, constructed would be perhaps 120. Um, the other possibility is that the second legion was there and they just redid the roof on some of the buildings and made them in, when, when the sixth legion moved in. Those are the kind of things we're not really sure. Um, but we do know that the sixth legion was there for the Bar Kokhba revolt. Now, does, is, that, is that something that people know about Bar Kokhba revolt? Okay, so very famous is the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD that, that ended the, the, the temple worship effectively changing uh, the way things were done in Jerusalem. Less well known are these other revolts. There was a revolt in 115 to 117 in Alexandria and on Crete, um, if I'm remembering correctly. And then in 132, there was another revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt. And that ended up with the just a desolation of uh, the Galilee region. That's in the, the square there, in the blue square. And um, this, was, this was a time where a man rose up and said on the Messiah, um, he minted his own coins, declared independence from Rome. Um, Rome was not happy about that. And so he was, uh, it took them about four years to put down this revolt uh, by Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba. And uh, Bar Kokhba means son of the morning star. There was a, there's rumors that some rabbis actually got behind his campaign um, and said, yes, this is the Messiah. It's a very interesting story. Um, and it all takes place up in that same kind of region up there. And the, and the Roman Sixth Legion um, that we were digging up uh, probably had a very big involvement in that. We're not exactly sure what that was. And then afterwards, after all of that, the history goes dark for a while until about, uh, you know, 300 or so. Um, it's, it's not dark, but it's hard to tell exactly what was happening as this city developed around it. But we do see kind of how, um, how it was structured. I don't want to spend forever on these slides, but you can see the square now that, that I spent a lot of time explaining a square. You can kind of see it uh, revealing some of its secrets. Here we have a wall foundation, and it's not in line with the square that we dug. Um, so our square is crooked, as you can see. But you can see the wall, the line. I put a little dashed line there so you can see there's a Roman wall or the, the fort coming up. Um, and then you start to see all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, so we have, you can see the technology on that iPad and, and some of this other uh, technology being used, but you see a tile floor coming up um, on the left-hand side. You see what looks like pipes, perhaps. In some places you see stone. And this is probably, um, this is uh, with, with high certainty, the Principium, the, the the military commander's um, mansion, if you will. Um, and so it wouldn't be surprising that he would have running water or running sewage, right? From up on the hill where he is. And that sewage would run down uh, the hill in these pipes. And so toilets have been uncovered. I, I need to get my toilet pictures up. I have. Um, I have all kinds of pictures, guys, that I just haven't had time to get together. Uh, I, by the way, I have a website that I'm putting together, jonathankhenry.com, I believe. Um, and I'm going to put all kinds of pictures on there. And toilets will be on there because they, they're actually much more important than you would like to think, right? Um, in fact, Vespasian, who was the emperor who came to Israel to put down this insurrection in 70, made a lot of his fortune and became an emperor by virtue of pay toilets. 
um, use it charging money for public toilets. Um, and so one of the one of my favorite things to do when I go on a on a site visit is to kind of uh, find out find the public bath, find the public toilets, um, because nothing gets you in touch with life in in the ancient world than just thinking about what it was like to be a bare basic human being like we are right in that infrastructure. So it's nice to know that there's plumbing, right? If you're well enough off, if you live near enough to the top of the hill. Um, the business that you do in the morning or whenever will fly away from you to somewhere else. Um, and you can be thankful that you don't live at the bottom of that hill. And you can guess what kind of people are living and working near the bottom of a hill where a gravitational sewage system is set up, right? So um, the lower parts of the city would tend to to smell worse, um, and you will see this in a lot of ancient cities. In fact, um, if you look like Pool of Salon, for instance, in Jerusalem, you know that lower part of the city is the poorer part of the city, and and um, a lot of that is just because of smells and things like this. So, um, I, for one, was just in awe of the um, amount of pipe that we just dug up from from all over the place. Uh, the pipe just runs all up and down this property. I'll show you momentarily how big it is. Now, what I wanted to show was on this layer, I ended up digging. I, I'm, I like to, to play in the dirt. So um, I did a lot of digging. If there was digging to be done, I volunteered. Um, I liked, you know, I wanted to be active. Um, and I ended up digging up a, a Middle Bronze Age layer right underneath the Roman city. And this is where I said it doesn't look like much, but you have Roman rubble on top. And at the bottom where that bucket is, there is a gap of millennia. And the Romans just come right in and, and they even jammed some of the uh, ancient rubble into their construction. It's like, oh, we need, a, we need some old rocks to jam in here. Well, let's use some of this ancient uh, Canaanite stuff. You know, just jam it in there like it's, like it's trash. It's really interesting. And this was kind of my favorite thing was before we were even done with the week that these pipes came out, tour buses already started to show up. Uh, that's how quickly the news spread amongst tour guides. Be the first to see the Roman site of Legio coming out of the ground. And people loved it. Um, so one of the questions Father Gutlinski, Gutlinski had for me was, you know, will this be a major archeological park? This and the and the and the church, which I need to get to. I need to. I'm out of practice uh, uh, on being succinct, aren't I? I need to speed up here very, very um, forthwith. But I think that's 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 a pretty cool thing. That this is, I think, going to be a, an archaeological park that you can go to. You can visit it. Coronavirus will be over. You'll be out there with everybody, and you'll be having a great time uh, looking at Legio yourself. Um, now we can compare this with other fortresses. Um, and this is, um, I believe one that is in Britain and, um, essentially in the middle, you will have, um, let's see, where do we have the Principium? Here we go. The Principium is in the middle. This is the, this is the, um, mansion, the, the leaders, um, part of the, of the, the fort, but I want to give a sense of scale of this because it, like everything I've shown is little squares, but look at these football fields. Um, these are football fields that I put together um, to represent the size of that site, of that Roman fort, uh, the area. And it's quite large. And um, you don't really feel that until you're walking across that, that field at the end of a long day, but it's a very big, it's a very big piece of property. Um, so so I, I think that what we can do then is start to get a sense then of what, what it would have looked like a long time ago. And I think it's kind of fun. We'll just use our imaginations just a little bit if that's all right. Um, but first of all, you can see the squares that we got dug out. And then um, if you can look, you see now 
this site in relation to the prison in the background. You can see a site that looks like an industrial or, or um, like warehouses and things like that. That's a maximum security prison, Megiddo maximum security prison, um, just right over that little nest of trees there. Um, but if you can imagine when the moats were dug out um, and when everything was uh, still standing, it was a much larger and more imposing structure. This is one, one model of what that could have looked like. Um, I think this is probably a bit more convincing. Um, this is an Eastern model, um, but you get a sense of what, what that valley looked like then with the Romans occupying it. Um, and I think it would have been a little bit more colorful this is one thing that doesn't get done well, uh, or, or I guess enough in ancient art. Is a lot of a lot of stuff that we see that looks just like white plaster from antiquity. Um, wasn't just white plaster back then. A lot of it was colored in blues and greens and reds and all kinds of things. Like if you've seen, you know, like Egyptian colors and um, just exotic colors. So there would have probably been a lot more color to this, but. You get a sense of the size and the scale of this thing and you know put troops around it and next thing you know it's pretty cool um yeah i photoshopped that i'm pretty proud of that um so uh so this is a, this is an interesting thing to keep in mind is for instance if you're studying um armageddon if you're looking at the one time that this occurs in the book of revelation um, I just wanted to read a commentary. If you, you know, Armageddon is one of those famous words, right? Like you say it and everybody goes, oh, that's, that's a disaster, right? Uh, I don't know where you live, but where I live, if it's going to snow a lot, they say that snowmageddon is coming. You know, like um, it's just become a word, like snowmageddon doesn't mean anything. It's just the back end of mageddon put onto the word snow. What does that mean? Nothing, right? But the word Megiddon, Megiddo, like has evolved into this term that means destruction and apocalypse and the end of everything. And, um, and that comes from the site that we were just looking at. If you yawned once, you know, you yawned at Armageddon. Think about it. <laughs> this is, you know, what many people think is, is the uh, end of the world. So I thought we would look at that just very briefly, its importance textually. Um, so this is a Bible dictionary. I just selected a quote from the ancient site of Megiddo was abandoned in the Persian era more than 500 years before Revelation was written. Therefore, it's unlikely that the author of the Revelation knew the actual location of the ancient city. And I have to question this because um, even though the particular sixth legion was likely not established in Legio, um, there was probably already a, a sizable Roman fort there for the second legion that was there previously and who knows what was there before. And so um, it was not, I don't think, quite as bleak as this author sees it. Um, but then again, we have now the advantage of that archaeological dig. And this author didn't quite have that uh, when they set to write this. And this is uh, repeated again. Um, um, I'm just putting in some like commentaries. Uh, all of these attempts to find a specific meaning for Armageddon fail to convince it's more likely that a more general reference is intended building on the Old Testament connection of Megiddo with warfare. Um, I think that's that's very possible. And, and you know, I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, but I think that it's um, it also could be possible that having a, a gigantic Roman uh, uh, legion parked at the same place would also maybe start to um, uh, give some more contemporary and immediate significance to someone writing um, nearer to that time. So I think what we're getting, what I, what I would get out of this in terms of the text here is that, um, you know, maybe consider the possibility that the author of the book of Revelation is thinking of Rome and Roman troops and Roman troop movements, um, which were very consequential at this time, um, very world changing. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and here's the headlines then that I came home to, um, to kind of show you a little bit about how people are reading the kind of things that I was just telling you. Um, so the Times of Israel say, in the first Imperial Roman legionary camp uncovered near Megiddo, 
Archaeologists unearthed remains of a 2,000 year old Galilee garrison of Sixth Legion Ferrata, where 5,000 men kept order at the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, and they're assuming their newspaper readers know what Bar Kokhba revolt means, right? Um, the only permanent Roman military camp ever discovered in the region. Similarly, um, in archaeology. And then here's um, one that emphasized Armageddon uh, that someone sent me and said, hey, uh, is Armageddon about to happen because you guys dug this up? And I said, no, friend, I don't think it is. I don't think we hit the hit the end of the world button while we were digging. Uh, but now, six years later, maybe we did. <laughs> maybe that's what went wrong. We might have hit the end of the world button. And that's why uh, 2020 was, was the way it was. I kid. Um, hopefully that's not too out of line. So uh, here's the new Armageddon as we can now see it. Um, a Roman castrum. So I have 3,500 soldiers, but it could be up to 5,000. Um, wives, children, servants, and dignitaries surrounded by a growing city and, and a metropolis, Maxim, uh, Maximinopolis is the name, the site of the oldest known Christian church remains and the site of regional power. And I want to look very quickly at this, at this church. How much time do I have? I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to continue speaking if that's all right. Yes, yes, absolutely, John, please do so. Well, if people are nodding uh, their heads to keep talking, I, you know, it's a random sample but I, I will talk to you. Okay, good. Yes, yes, please, please. So one of the interesting things about this church is that Yotam found it, excavated it um, in 2003 to 2005. Well, that's a whole 10 years before the Roman military camp came up. And the Roman military camp, I think is important context for this church because the Roman military camp is sort of the, the kernel from which a lot of these other buildings spread out. And so um, as we look at this church, um, I think it's one of the interesting things is now that we see that it's right in this military encampment, when you see um, support from a military figure in this church, in this house of worship or, or prayer, don't be surprised. So here's, um, oh, I need to take that. <laughs> Ignore that one, two, three, four, that's for a later slide. Um, so this is the front entrance of Megiddo prison. This is where <laughs> Yotam had to go in every day to do his digging. Uh, quite a thought, right? So there's talk about closing this down, moving the entire establishment elsewhere so that this can become a site of a permanent um, archeological um, exhibit. So you'll be able to hopefully go yourself one of these days and see this stuff or have people you know near and dear to you go take video bring it back to you you know that kind of thing um so here's one of the inscriptions coming out of the ground i just like this picture um because you can see the shininess of those mosaics um and how you know they cleaned up just so nice and new as if as if you were, they were ready to receive um, somebody, you know, right now uh, uh, anew. It's just a beautiful, a beautiful mosaic. Um, and I'm pretty sure I see Yotam's uh, gray pants there in the background, uh, talking to the press um, or or someone. So here's here's some of the inscriptions that are from this. I wanted I wanted to um, see these these inscriptions at the top right hand corner i'm going to look at a couple of those these are these are quite important so i think it's worth looking for a moment and here's a readable translation of this mosaic guyanus also called before parfurius centurion our brother has made the pavement at his expense as an act of liberality rutius has carried out the work and um so you have a guy whose nickname is purple cloak who is most likely a centurion. Now, I say most likely, there's, there's some debate about the little symbol that tells us what makes us believe he's a centurion. And um, let's see if I can pull up a pointer here. Do I have a pointer? Okay, maybe, maybe if I do it this way. Um, well, 
anyway, yeah, laser pointer. Do you see this on your screen? Do you see my little laser pointer moving around on the mosaic? Okay. So, um, Guyanus, um, okay, here we go. It's this little sideways cross looking thing. I'm circling my pointer around it. It almost looks like a person picking up a cross and putting it over their back or something like that. It's a, it's a puzzling little symbol. And so when I first saw this, I thought, well, that doesn't mean centurion because I'm accustomed to reading Christian manuscripts from the third century, fourth century, fifth century later. And so when I see something that looks like that, it's, it's an abbreviation for Christos in my mind because it looks like a cross. And so the, there's a lot of different ways of putting this together. And I'm sure you're familiar with this. I'm, the many symbols uh, all around you, perhaps, that say, you know, Christos and, and, are, and are this, you know, symbolic. But this is, um, this is actually the symbol most likely for a centurion. And this, this shows up in other places for people who are indisputably, <clears throat> pardon me, indisputably centurions and not Christians in their disposition. So I, I learned something new as I was reading this mosaic, which is the um, the little pictogram for centurion in writing. And and it made sense to me that this could be Christian, right? So it was worth taking the time to look at. Um, but you'll we'll see why it's pretty sure why uh, this individual is a Christian in a moment. But even though it doesn't say so explicitly on this screen, um, so our brother, you know, this this might be a good clue, um, has made the pavement at his expense an act of liberality and Brutius carried out the work. So you have the donor, uh, who is a centurion, and you have um, the actual workman, Brutius, listed here. And um, it was the donor's honor to put the mosaic here. This is very common all over the ancient world. If you go to um, churches, if you go to Jewish synagogues all across the Galilee region, where this is, um, you know, adjacent. If you go to um, churches all across Asia Minor there's, or synagogues, um, there's donors, there's men, women, donors. Um, it's a question of having money and being in support of this community. And so this is a centurion who is um, in support of the Christian community. And this is probably, you know, maybe 75 years before Constantine. And, you know, who's famous for what, the, you know, legalizing, so legalizing Christianity within the Roman Empire. Of course, it was a messier process. But um, so the, a lot of people have been really thrown off by this. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I didn't get thrown off at all by this. And there's good reason. It's, I think we can maybe correct some perceptions about Roman uh, dispositions towards Christians at various points in time throughout the third century when this was found. So we're talking the 200s. And in a moment, I'll contextualize this, why, why that's a big deal. Yeah, this is the Akeptos uh, mosaic inscription. The God-loving Akeptos has offered the table to God, Jesus Christ, as a memorial. And I put a more like wooden translation on the, on the right. Um, and this is a pretty big deal because here you have the earliest archeological evidence, you have God, Jesus Christ. So first of all, it's it's a big deal because you have um, Jesus Christ together, the first archaeological attestation of Jesus Christ, but you have what looks to be sort of a Trinitarian, proto-Trinitarian, something of that nature going on here in the, in the grammar. And I'm going to turn on the pointer again so you can see what I mean about abbreviation. So you see that I have my pointer on. You see that long, straight line of uh, the little... Um, tesserae, the little um, stones, little black stones. Those are all abbreviations underneath those lines. So these are called, um, oh my goodness, it, it escapes my mind, um, nomine sacra, that's the sacred name, uh, Theo Jesu Christo. So that's what you get there. And so on the, my little translation here, I kind of put a dash in there just to sort of indicate that it's abbreviation, but there's nothing unusual about those abbreviations. And in fact, if you look at like a, a, a Caesar putting up an inscription to honor himself, he would abbreviate half the stuff on that inscription. It'd be uh, like 
Augustus Caesar, you know, tribunal of this and that and this and that. And half of those words would be abbreviated. It's not a big deal for stuff to be abbreviated in ancient materials. A lot of it is. So um, I just want to like make sure that that's, um, that's not thought of as like being out of the ordinary in the ancient times, but it's just little conventions that we have to learn. Um, the big deal about this table is it's thought to be the altar, an altar in the church. You can see, um, so the Akiptus inscription is on the right of that. And this is probably a very important part in this house of worship. And this woman, Akeptus, has donated uh, the funds for this to be built and for it to be erected for Christian worship. Um, so she must have been someone very wealthy. And on the other end of this, maybe not wealthy, maybe, um, you know, maybe just beloved of the church community. You know, it's, it's possible. Um, so the mosaic of the four women on the other side, remember Primula and, and Kiriaka and Dorothea and moreover, remember Christes. Um, some people have suggested these are four uh, women martyrs. It's possible, it's also possible that these could have been um, donors to the seminary as well. I mean, not the seminary, the, um, <laughs> the church, I'm sorry. Uh, this might have been donors to the church. Um, all kinds of inscriptions are known. So it's, it's, it's like the kind of things that uh, scholars are gonna be debating about for probably a very long time. But um, it's, it's just good to know that women and men were involved at this degree in this early house of worship uh, where you have a centurion who just interestingly enough is donating money for this uh, mosaic to be built with a, with a fish, you know, um, right in the middle and all of these other figurative designs. I just think this is a beautiful, uh, image of what uh, life and worship were like in the Jezreel Valley in, you know, let's say 250, the year 250 or so. And so some to, to get to the point of like, is, is it so unusual to have Roman elites sympathizing with Christian faith? Um, the, the kind of things that I work with, I do tend to get more into like uh, dealing with what the Roman elites were up to more than what the average person on the ground. It's kind of unfortunate. I'm an average person on the ground, but my studies have often taken me more to the elite. Um, people like this, for instance, Emperor Severus Alexander. And I just thought this was really interesting to bring home the point that even in the emperor's own household, I'll read some of this quote to you in a moment. Even in the emperor's own household, his mother, um, mother-in-law was Julia Mamia, his mother-in-law or mother. I put mother-in-law, but now I'm, I'm doubting myself. Somebody can Wikipedia that. It escapes my mind. Um, but Severus Alexander was the Roman emperor from 222 to 235. That's around when this, when this uh, church is being constructed. Um, that's around when this centurion is perhaps finding Christian faith. Well, let's, let's read about uh, Julia Mamia. I have that's uh, Severus Alexander, and beneath him is, is a bust of Julia Mamea. And this is a quote from uh, a scholar who's really summarizing in one place what it took me a long time to, to figure out. So I'm just going to read. She was a most pious woman, that is a Christian, according to Eusebius in his uh, history of the, of the faith, his church history, who records that she summoned by military escort no less a figure than Origen, great teacher of the early church and heard from him about the fame of the Lord and the excellence of the divine teaching. Even more interesting is the fragment of a letter to Julia Mamea by the Bishop Hippolytus of Rome, a, a, a pope, explaining the, the symbolism of Exodus 25.10, thou shalt make an ark of a covenant from acacia wood. The existence of this letter should incline us to accept the statement of the Augustan history that according to a contemporary writer, Alexander worshiped Christ and Abraham beside Orpheus and Apollonius in his private chapel. He was sympathetic to Christians. He was charged, he charged the Christian intellectual Julius Africanus, a celebrated correspondent of origin with the establishment of a library in the Pantheon of all places. And an Africanus dedicated to him the first non-theological work penned by a Christian author, uh, the miscellaneous encyclopedia called, believe it or not, Girdles. Um, but it was a very pious work. So uh, all of that to say that right within the emperor's own household and maybe in the emperor's own chapel, his own private devotion, 
um, there is a layer of Christian sympathy. And this was, this radiated out and amongst the Roman elite of the highest ranks. So there's, there's this really interesting thing. So you have a lot of the lowest ranking people, slaves are your mass of Christians, right? Your mass of believers are your lowest element in society. And then you have sort of your middle class of, of merchants and householders who are able to bring together houses, uh, households to worship. Um, maybe donate mosaics, for instance, donate altars, for instance, to support in various ways. And then you have at the very highest of ranks, those that are able to embark in building projects and and publishing projects on behalf of the Christian faith. And so I think it's just a really interesting little snapshot. Um, some, some contemporary churches with, um, with the one that we're looking at, there's a very famous one called Dora Europus. Maybe perhaps Father Kuplinski can get somebody who talks about Dora Europus because that's a very, maybe he has, I don't know, a hundred, maybe this has come up uh, in a hundred talks. Um, but Dora Europus is, is a beautiful um, place. It's famous for its synagogue and temple. Here, here's a, I just had to include this. This artwork from the synagogue in Dura Europus is just beautiful and it goes all around. And, and you can actually see this if you live in the United States in the Northeastern United States, it's easy, easier, um, I guess, not right now because everything's closed, but at Yale University um, Art Museum, you can see all this stuff. So it's been, Dora Europus has been destroyed by ISIL um, in the Levant, you know, ISIS. And, um, uh, but the artifacts remain in New Haven. You can see most of this stuff. Um, so Good Shepherd, um, Healing of the Paralytic. I'm hoping some stuff like that will come out of, of the Jezreel Valley now that we know there's stuff. Another near contemporary St. Peter's Shrine in Rome by the Red Wall. Um, there's a church in Aqaba. I just thought I'd put these up here for anybody who might be interested in, um, in know, you know, uh, looking these sort of uh, sites up. Um, and then here's here's kind of a picture of what a house church might have looked like back then. The 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 house of worship. This is sort of a base. This is sort of based upon Dura Europus. Um, so you would have gatherings in each of the rooms. I think that our house of worship in um, Megiddo doesn't follow this pattern, um, but but that really doesn't matter because across across the Mediterranean um, there were really just a wide variety of traditions growing up about how to build a church building. Um, I've been I've been to church buildings just all over um, North Africa, you know. Europe and, and a lot of them are from a very similar time. And a lot of them are just, um, they, have, they have a lot of variations uh, within the mix that are of theological significance. But this is, this is kind of a general idea to say this early on, the reason I put this up is to say this, um, this early on, um, it's interesting that we have this much structure um, to the building and this much, um, not just structure, in terms of the, the construction itself, but also the use of it. And we start to really see the use and the art and the architecture taking off in a big way from this point on. And, and this is in fact, when you start to see um, art taking off elsewhere, really Christian art, um, like I showed you in Dura Europus, um, but you start to see it blossoming in the catacombs around the same time. And uh, the art isn't necessarily distinct from the art that you would see um, elsewhere, but the subject matter was distinct. And the intent of it was definitely distinct from uh, the art that you would see elsewhere. So just a little bit of a talk about the, um, the house church there. I think it's very important to, to put that into context and to know exactly kind of what we're looking at. Now, this is a slide that, um, you know, this, I guess this talk is being recorded. So I thought, you know, for somebody who's really just interested in the tedium of typing all this out, or maybe I could copy and paste this stuff and throw it. You know what I'll do? I'll put this in that the Facebook post. I'll just copy and paste this in there so you can click on stuff. How about that? That way you don't have to type. That'd so, be perfect. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I'll do. I'll do that as soon as I get out of here. And uh, that way you can do more reading all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I've talked uh, longer than I talked in quite a while um, because let's face it, my family doesn't want to hear me talking this long. And this is as long as uh, most meetings I have in a day's time. So uh, 
you're you're very heroic for putting up with this talk for uh, the last hour, and uh, I will be happy to take any questions that might have arisen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Uh, greatly appreciate that. There were some questions that I'm happy to read to you. If you'd like to ask the question uh, directly, please raise your hand, turn your camera so you know who you are, and then we can, uh, you know, turn you turn your microphone on. Uh, the uh, question was asked, uh, is it possible to tell uh, if church had an orientation and uh, if was it oriented toward Jerusalem or toward East and how the people have congregated, if it's possible to guess? So I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you have that question because now I can look that up. I don't know. Um, I think not because I believe that's the kind of thing that we would mention um, that would stand out, orientation. Um, and it's hard to, the, so this is one of the reasons why this site is gonna be debated I think for some time is because there's all these little nitpicky details, right? It's like, oh, I forgot to ask that, I forgot to check. Um, and scholars are gonna be going back and forth and those are the kinds of questions that are actually gonna be very determinative in helping to understand the, the site itself. Was this a full-fledged church or was this a devotional site on the way to being a church? Um, and will that be revelatory about um, the development of, 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 of church buildings? You know, and so orientation will be a part of that. You might go look and see that immediately. <laughs> you know, you might be Googling that right now um, to see the answer to that. But I don't know that off the top of my head. And I, and I just don't, I don't think that there is any specific orientation to it. I think it's um, the way the way that site evolved. It's built into a house, a homestead. It's built into an estate. So the foundation of that site itself wasn't. I mean, there's a very good likelihood that it wasn't set up with any kind of worship in mind. It was repurposed. Um, you know, let's say for instance the householder. Uh, has a big mansion and he converts to um, converts to Christianity, and then and then maybe this becomes his work is you know repurposing a large section of his private property for use. This wouldn't be entirely unusual um, for this to happen. So like if there's no orientation to the to the site, that's nothing to worry about. That's not saying you know oh there was no orientation to sites you know that early you know, big problem or whatever. Um, it just was probably not um, thought of when this site was being repurposed, uh, which is- uh, John, a, a point of clarification. Was the site repurposed? Because I read somewhere that it's actually first ever found space used by Christians that was built to be used as such uh, as in Dura Europos and in Church in Aqaba and Lollingston Villa in England, those are all the repurposed space, you know, living space. And over yeah. there, it seems like it was built and it's not easily traceable if it was used for anything else before then. Yeah, so that's actually a very good clarification. So the, it's not as if um, I'm saying that there was a room like the one I'm in and then they took the curtains down and they, you know, um, and they hung up Christian pictures and took down, you know, you know, or put Christian pavement down. Uh, the property itself, uh, so when you look at the site plan, you see how buildings are laid out next to other buildings. And there's sort of a determination that begins to occur as buildings and, and um, structures go up next to each other. So, um, yeah, so the, the site, the, like the, the actual building, the walls themselves, the foundation itself, um, that is very famous for being, um, purpose built for Christian use, but the, the estate, um, I, I, and I want to make sure that, that I'm not confusing anybody with that, but the estate, the property itself, I don't believe, um, uh, you know, there's any reason to think that it had a Christian significance prior to this, this setting down of this, of this, um, of this house of worship there. So yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, also, a question was uh, that based on the pictures, it seems that the church was outside the confine of the classroom itself. Was it in the adjacent village or how it's where it was located in proximity to the officers headquarters and such? 
Yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's quite a number of yards away. Um, so I, I'll, I'll go back to the slide um, just to kind of maybe, um, yeah, so it's, it's in the village that grew up uh, in the vicinity of the castrum. So uh, it's under the prison and I wanna just situate that, uh, okay, visibly. Hold on just one second, share screen. Okay, so as you can see the prison back there um, in the background is, um, you know, this is this is the extent of what we were able to cover there in the Principium, the, the whole site is in this, you know, this um, worked over area and it extends out, but the village of um, Kefirotne and um, Max, Maximopolis are out here, and this is the site of the, of the, and I'm not sure exactly where it is on here. Is it? Um, anyway, it's, 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 at a, it's at a distance. So you can see there's at least a, there's a uh, distance between the military uh, camp itself and the, and the structure, and that would be true of the, the synagogue. Um, there's a Jewish synagogue there as well, um, but it would have involved people who were involved with, with the Roman camp as well. So it's, you know, distance is relative to, um, you know, it's not an isolated, it's not an isolated thing. So it's logical a centurion would be there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there was one more question. If any of the burials were found in the area, uh, uh we, did you find the cemetery associated with the camp or with the village uh you know i'm not up on the cemeteries um or on the on the on the human rain finds um that's something that might i don't i i actually my friend um i i spoke to my friend a couple of weeks ago i i said is there anything new that's come out uh, in the last couple of years since i've been there um and he said no not really and he's he's responsible for a lot of um the sorting and processing and all this sort of stuff. Um, so I, I just, I don't think that the, that's come out yet, uh, come out of the ground yet, but that's something to keep an eye on. Those are the kinds of stuff that will be, um, will be coming up soon. So the, the pages I, I sent, the academia pages, um, those are the scholars that are involved in this dig or in, in charge of this dig. So I'm sending you to their actual um, sites and I'll put that in the Facebook comments. That way you can keep up, like for instance, if they are digging this year, whatever comes out, they'll keep you up to speed on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And there'll be people holding stuff up just like I was in my slideshow and you'll get an interactive um, and ongoing look. So I, I don't think those graves will come out. I, I don't think, um, but I could be wrong about that. Like I said, I'm, this is a little bit out of my specialization. Um, so I'm, I'm going off of what I'm able to keep up with. Um, From what I read, somewhere in the territory of the camp, they found a pot with cremains um, of, of what, I don't know how it was determined, but supposedly one of the soldiers have been cremated uh, and that was found, but it's not a formal cemetery. It was curiously enough found on the, on the territory of the costume, if I'm not mistaken, Yeah. but, that, but not formal cemetery or anything of that nature. Yeah, you know, one thing to look at, you know, with this slide, for instance, is just how little um, you can get done in just hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of labor. So uh, look at the field and just think about all the cool stuff that's going to be coming out over the next few years. Um, that's why I urge people, you know, if you are interested in doing it, do it because uh, there needs to be more hands on it. You know, um, the, 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 it would be nice to know, right, faster. Um, and the more people digging, the more we'll know. It's, I think that we're gonna, by the time this thing is said and done, we're gonna know so much more about a Roman military camp and we'll know a lot more about the interaction between the Roman military camp and a Jewish village, which is really remarkable, Jewish Samaritan village, and also these early Christian interactions. I think that, I think we're gonna get a lot more insight. This is like, I'm not giving you a teaser, I'm giving you what's there, but I think what's there is a teaser of, um, what we're going to find in the next couple of years.
So. Uh, another question, John Kim. Why and when Kemp was abandoned? Uh, yeah, so that's one of those kinds of questions that um, uh, is, drives people crazy, you know, just trying to figure that out. Um, you know, why did the Second Legion leave that area uh, and the Sixth Legion move in? Um, when did these things happen? These are very basic questions that we don't have all the answers to, or in many cases, any of the answers to. Um, what's stunning is that you can have an entire military camp, thousands of people, and not know why it disappeared. Um, or not know much of anything, because there's nothing written about, there's very little written about this stuff. So we have to go upon the evidence of just little shards, bullet pits. You know, there's really just not a historical account besides um, bare bones chronology. So yeah, why was it abandoned? Well, it could have been that, um, you know, the Legio Sixth Legion uh, was called into action somewhere else. They were always moving legions around with, when there was a disturbance. Um, so the Eastern, or when the, um, started to have uh, unrest in various parts. So they were sent to, um, they were sent to combat Persia on a couple of occasions. Um, I believe they were with Julian, if I'm not mistaken, in the 360s, I could be wrong about that. But they were in, they were in a number of incursions to the East, uh, depending on what happened, you know, the number of troops that got decimated, being re, um, recamped elsewhere. I mean, this was not unusual. So like in its, in its many hundreds of years of history, the Roman Sixth Legion, wasn't camped here until like one, you know, 20, one, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just interesting how over hundreds of years, these, these Roman legions were um, camped and then rarely dissolved. That's an interesting thing in of itself to read about is if you want to look into um, just the, the Roman military legions, there's actually a pretty good, surprisingly good Wikipedia article on that. I, I you know, I've often been shy about sending people to Wikipedia but I just looked at that article on Roman uh, legions, and um, it seems like it's really like somebody's been over it um, for accuracy for the most part. So it, it gives you a good overview of like how these troop movements are and how little we know. You know, we know a lot, but we also don't know a lot. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of I don't know to many of these questions. <laughs> Sad to say, that's why we keep that's why we keep going back to study. It's because like, oh, I don't know. I better go back to work tomorrow. I might find out more. Yeah. Excellent. Dear friends, any more questions, please? I just wonder what the summation actually means. What is common occurrence or mostly a big stick that was held over the soldier's head? Was it a comment, Emily, or actually what is common? Was it common occur occurrence or mostly a big stick that was held over question? Okay. Uh, decimation. Oh, decimation. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, you're getting to like Roman military practice and history. That's not something I'm a specialist in. I don't think there's a lot of cases where we have like anybody claiming that decimation. The decimation, for those that aren't up on it, is where, you know, the leader goes, okay, every 10th guy gets killed, right? So um, it's like you're decimating the, the troops um, for punish them or whatever, you know, you did, you did bad today, it's decimation. And I don't think there's a lot of actual accounts of that being carried out. I think there might be a couple of cases. Um, but as, as with anything, uh, you know, we don't know. They're, they could have done it every day, <laughs> you know, how would we know? It's... Uh, I, but I, I don't think it's thought that that was a that that's one of those sort of like fascinating for us to read about um, sort of scurrilous details, you know, but I just don't think it was a con like, why would you waste your human resources for one thing. And the Romans were very careful about maintaining their resources and, and um, reserving them where they could, especially in areas like like this. Um, they were getting killed badly enough by the enemy. Um, just as a know. point of discussion, we could say that. Um, although decima decimation is certainly mentioned in mm -hmm. the historical references, the fact that on many more occasions entire legions would perish in the battle uh, yes. have actually proven that uh, retreat by the Roman legions was not that common occurrence. Yeah. Uh, uh, that they, they fought, they didn't run. 
And another mm -hmm. thing is the structure in the battle of the Roman legion was such that the newbies were put in front lines, then mm -hmm. moderately experienced troop on the second line and the most experienced ones at the back. Mm -hmm. And they actually served uh, as the last resort, but at the same time, they were the ones who were pushing the newbies up at the spears against the enemies. And that's yeah, how exactly. the newbies would acquire their experience. Yeah. So even if you wanted to retreat, those soldiers who had a grasp of the battle simply mm -hmm. didn't let you. Yeah, it might be easier to do a decimation on the spot. Like, right. Oh, so okay. on, many, on many occasions, like you see in the movie, where soldiers engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, mm -hmm. historically, it really wasn't the case all that much. Uh, mm -hmm. It was more of a depiction of a Viking shield wall. <laughs> That's how Romans actually persevere, throwing spears and by organization. They were much more better trained to fight as uh, units, uh, teamwork more than yeah. individual hand-to-hand -hand combat. So in that, uh, we have a lot of impressions from the Hollywoodian style depiction, you know, action flicks, but it doesn't represent uh, historical Roman tactic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a whole fascinating topic, like Roman Roman military history. Is, some, is I dabble in that just because it's so... Well, but it was such a massive part of the existence and support of the empire, so that it's... Yeah. Uh, not just the military within the state; it's an essential, an integral part of the of the of the society. Builders. We don't think of Roman army as builders, but who built those roads? Who built the bridges, arches? Saying slaves? No, that was the army who built most of the massive construction work. Oh yeah, yeah. Civil engineering. Civil engineering, indeed. Well, oh anyway. yeah, yeah. So, uh, if anybody has any questions about. Um, anything of this sort uh you know or, or comments or whatever i have a website up but if you want to if you want to talk um my email address is jhenry at princeton.edu so um, that's i thought i'd throw that out if i if i've offended anyone or whatever you know like i have any questions that you might have or comment or, or anything like that i i'm a pretty friendly person and yeah. I'm happy. so if you okay. have any questions please it's time to ask Meanwhile, um, uh, I want to thank John on behalf of us all for a wonderful presentation and also to make an announcement uh, that we continue our uh, educational series. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to have Father Peter Harrington, historic, historian and enthusiast from England, talking about Anglo-Saxon Christianity. It's going to be third installation in the series. Then uh, on the uh, on March twenty first, we're going to have to hear from Professor um, uh, uh, Linda Shafran of University of Toronto on the cave monasteries of Apulia, southern Italy. You know, and uh, close interaction between the Benedictine communities in Basilian, which is Orthodox Byzantine monks in Italy. Then after that, we're confirming the date, but. Um, we have several lectures which dates may fluctuate. We're going to have um, um, Father uh, Ian from uh, uh, Megiddo, Franciscan Park, where the synagogue from the first century have been discovered in recent years. After that, we're going to have from Professor Betts of the University of Durham on the excavation of the uh, uh, monastery at Lindisfarne. So it's the inauguration of the Viking Age, coming of Vikings to England, destruction of the Lindisfarne Monastery. We'll be talking about excavations there. And also um, uh, we'll be talking to archeologists from Jerusalem, Benjamin Storchen, on the finding of absolute unique thing within the Byzantine history of the Holy Land, that's the Church of Glorious Martyrs. One of the best preserved Byzantine basilicas dedicated to a known martyr in the vicinity of the Jerusalem and a very major pilgrim center. So even as we're working on the dates um, and uh, times may shift, uh, but we continue to meet on Sunday, we'll continue doing so even throughout the great land. So please stay in touch, stay in tune. Announcements will be posted on my Facebook page. Those of you who are capable of processing Russian, we also offering uh, lectures in Russian, various academic subjects related to Christianity twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays, so please stay tuned. And all of the recordings of our conversations are posted on YouTube, 
channel under my name, which is Ilya Gatlinsky. So if you're not able to attend, all the records are there. And again, if there are no more questions, there are thank you, thank you, many thank you notes. God bless you. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. We're happy to do that. So thank you very much for attending. Dr. Henry, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for the amazing things that you have shared. And dear friends, we hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Have a blessed night. Bye-bye.